Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the Langston Lecture in Bioethics 2021. Now, I would like to pass the time to our center director, Dr. Derry L, to kick off the event. Dr. L, please. Welcome, everyone, to the Langston Lecture 2001. I'm privileged to be co moderating this event with Professor Hon Nam Lee, Emeritus Professor of the Department of Philosophy at CHK. In previous years, the Lancet Lecture has brought eminent scholars in bioethics and moral philosophy to Hong Kong. This year, the special event needs to take place online. We are particularly obliged that Professor Peter Singer has kindly accommodated this very early hour in Eastern Standard Time to be with us. Thank you, Professor. May I now call upon Professor Francis Chan, Dean of the Faculty of Medicine, to deliver his welcoming remarks. Professor Chan. Thank you. Well, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, distinguished guests, colleagues, students, ladies and gentlemen. It is really my pleasure to welcome you all to the Lanson Lecture in Bioethics. The Lanson Lecture is an annual signature lecture endowed by a benefactor of our university in commemoration of his beloved mother, Ms. Chen Lan Yu. Since 2016, we have been inviting prominent moral philosophers and bioethicists to speak on bioethical issues with us. This year, we are very fortunate to have invited Professor Peter Singer, a moral philosopher and a great thinker of our times, to deliver the fifth Lanson Lecture. The topic of today's Lanson Lecture is Pandemic Ethics, Five Lessons. Um, I believe this is a very timely lecture for us as every nation in the world is now facing a crisis since the Spanish flu 100 years ago. And to tackle the pandemic, not only medical technology to produce vaccines, but also a defensible ethical policy regarding the distribution of medical resources, implementation of lockdowns, and human experimentation are really crucial to us. A set of sound pandemic ethics is long overdue and our need for it is extremely urgent. To learn more about this topic, we are very honored to have Professor Singer spending his valuable time with us today. And I'm glad to have our team bringing the Lancet Lecture online this year to allow everyone online and to participate without any social distancing concerns. <laughs> and I understand that Professor Hon Nam Lee has known Professor Singer for many years. And therefore, I would like to pass the time to Professor Lee to read the citations of Professor Singer. So, Professor Lee, please. Thank you. Born in Australia in 1946, Professor Peter Singer grew up in Melbourne. After high school, he studied history and philosophy at the University of Melbourne, where he received his BA and MA degrees. He then studied at the University of Oxford and received a B-field degree in philosophy in 1971. From 1971 to 73, he served as a Radcliffe lecturer at University College, Oxford. While at Oxford, his association with a vegetarian group led him to reflect on the morality of his own eating habit. In 1975, while visiting NYU, he published what would, be, what would become his most influential work, namely Animal Liberation, a new ethics for our treatment of animals. This groundbreaking work has been translated into more than 35 languages. This book has changed the eating habits of millions of people. If I may quote from <clears throat> Professor Singer, he says, quote, to give preference to the life of a being simply because that being is a member of our species would put us in the same position as racists who give preference to those who are members 
of their race. Unquote. If I may quote again, we have to speak up on behalf of those who cannot speak for themselves. Unquote. And finally, another quote, quote, the argument to prove man's superiority cannot shatter this hard fact. In suffering, the animals are our equals. Unquote. Professor Singh has also done extremely important work on well hunger and effective altruism. In his celebrated article, Famine, Affluence and Morality, published in 1972, he argues that people from an affluent society owes a moral duty to help starving people in Bangladesh. As he points out, quote, the Hebrew work for charity, Sadokar, Sadokar, simply means justice as this suggests for Jews giving to poor is no optional extra but an essential part of living a just life." Unquote. Professor Singer's book The Life You Can Save, first published in 2009, led him to found a non-profit organization of the same name which has raised more than 35 million US dollars for the most effective charities assisting people in extreme poverty. In 2015, he published another book, The Most Good You Can Do, where he argues that people should pursue the most rational and effective means for realizing their altruistic aims. Professor Singer is recipient of the 2021 Bergwan Prize, an award of one million US dollar given annually to a thinker whose ideas have, quote, profoundly shaped human self-understanding and advancement in a rapidly changing world." Unquote. Professor Singer has indicated that he will give all of his money to charity. In fact, he has given 40% of his income to charity on a regular basis. Professor Singer has written 33 books and edited more. In bioethics, he has written on abortion, euthanasia, infanticide, and surrogacy. His general ethical outlook is a conjunction of utilitarianism and a liberal outlook on what constitutes personhood. As he said, quote, the notion that human life is sacred just because it is human life is medieval, unquote. He has also written on climate change, environmental ethics, and civil disobedience. Regarding the connection between, between climate change and non-vegetarianism, he writes, quote, we are, quite literally, gambling with the future of our planet for the sake of hamburgers." Unquote. His book, Predator Ethics, has been translated into more than 25 languages. Professor Singer has also written on more theoretical topics such as evolutionary psychology, utilitarianism, intuitionism, and metaethics. In addition, he has written books on Hegel, on Marx, and on Henry Cedric. In 1999, Professor Singer became Ira de Camp Professor of Bioethics at Princeton University. It is rare that philosophical ideas can change the world, yet Professor Singer has done exactly that, changing the world through his ideas and action. While he regarded as, quote, the world's most influential living philosopher, unquote, he was selected by, by Time magazine as one of the hundred most influential people in the world. And his book, Animal Liberation, has been included in Time magazine's recent list of the hundred best nonfiction books published since 1923. Professor Singer was named a companion of the Order of Australia the highest civic honor in Australia for his services to philosophy and bioethics. Professor is not new to the Chinese University of Hong Kong. In 1999, he was a keynote speaker at a conference on practical ethics held here at the Chinese University of Hong Kong. In 2015, he delivered a lecture titled Animal and Ethics at the CHK Center for bioethics, also at the Chinese University of Hong Kong. I'm sure 
you want to hear what Professor Singer has to say about pandem pandemic ethics. So without further ado, let's welcome back Professor Peter Singer. Peter, Professor Singer, please. Thank you very much. Uh, I'd like to thank all of you for these introductions. Um, in particular, uh, Dr. Derek Au, um, uh, Professor Francis Chan, and of course, Professor uh, Han Lam Lee, who, as he was mentioned, uh, we go back more than 20 years uh, in giving me a connection with the Chinese University of, of Hong Kong. And of course, I want to thank the philanthropist who has made this lecture possible. Uh, I should say it's uh, my only regret about uh, having doing this online is that uh, I can't be in, in Hong Kong, but I do hope to be there again uh, sometime in, in, in the new year. Now let's uh, talk about the pandemic and the ethical issues that it has raised. Uh, it's posed old ethical questions in a new and sharper form, as well as giving rise to some new ethical issues. So I'm going to look at the lessons we can learn from five of these issues. Uh, the allocation of scarce medical resources, experimenting on humans, setting priorities for vaccination, when lockdowns are justified, and preventing more pandemics. So let me start with the question of uh, the allocation of scarce resources. In March 2020, the epicenter of the then emerging pandemic was Northern Italy, which soon had over 40,000 cases of COVID-19 and more than 3,000 deaths from it. There were not enough intensive care beds or ventilators for all the patients who needed them. Suddenly, the hypothetical situations that bioethicists, myself included, had long discussed in seminars with students and healthcare professionals became agonizingly real. The standard procedure for allocation for ICU beds has long been first come, first served. In other words, once admitted to an ICU bed, a patient can rely on staying there as long as it benefits them. This rule avoids the difficulty of telling a patient who is being kept alive in an ICU that they have to leave with death the likely outcome because another patient has better prospects of full recovery and long-term survival. But apart from that benefit, first come first served does not carry much moral weight. It means after all, that whether you live or die depends on the lottery of when you arrived in the emergency room. That is not the best way of deciding how to use scarce healthcare resources, but its deficiencies only come into sharp focus in a pandemic when there are not enough ICU beds and some patients will have to be turned away from the ICU and will die when admission to the ICU would have given them a chance to live. In these circumstances, the Italian Society of Anesthesia, Analgesia, Resuscitation and Intensive Care set up a working group that came up with a radical solution, replace the first come first served rule with a system of triage. Triage is a term that has its origins in Napoleon's army and the need for a small medical staff to deal with many wounded soldiers after a battle. The word suggests sorting into three classes. And for the French medical staff, these classes were those who will recover without treatment, those who will die whether or not they are treated, and those for whom treatment will make the difference between life and death. We will do the most good if we focus our resources on those in this third class while doing what we can to redu reduce the suffering of those in the other two classes. The recommendations of the Italian working group were more nuanced, but they were equally and quite explicitly concerned with maximizing the benefits that could be obtained with the limited healthcare resources available. They recommend admitting to the ICU those who have the greatest chance of survival and are likely to have the most years of life ahead of them. Not only age, 
but also the broader health status of the prospective patient is relevant. Patients who are elderly, frail, or have other health problems in addition to the virus may occupy an ICU bed for a much longer time than younger and healthier patients. Even if the more vulnerable patients survive, the time they spend on the ventilator may come at the cost of the deaths of two, three, or even more patients who would have been in and out of the ICU during that time. In a time of extreme shortage of resources, the working group says, these principles may require moving out of the ICU patients who are not responding well in order to make room for others for whom there is hope of a better response. The working group recommends taking into account the wishes of the patients, including advanced declarations, stating a wish not to be treated in specific circumstances. It also indicates that when patients are moved out of the ICU, this must not mean that they are simply abandoned. They must be given palliative care to reduce their suffering. In refreshing contrast to many bioethical declarations, the working group does not shy away from bold recommendations, nor does it try to hide what it is doing in obscure or ambiguous language. It demands transparency. Healthcare staff should tell patients and their families exactly what is happening and why. The guidelines do not attempt to answer all the questions raised by the need to make life and death decisions for individual patients. For example, how much weight should an admitting doctor give to age, which is usually easy to determine, as compared with life expectancy, which is arguably more significant, but always an estimate. My answer is that it is life expectancy that matters, not age. Other things being equal, it is more important to save younger lives because younger people are likely to live longer. But if we're comparing a 40-year-old with incurable cancer with a, seven, with a healthy 70-year-old, the illness negates the usual expectation that the younger person will live longer. At the height of the pandemic, proposals for age-based rationing were discussed in many countries and often met with opposition. In the United Kingdom, for example, Catherine Foote, Director of Evidence at the Centre for Aging Better, said that rationing care based on age shows, and I quote, a dangerous knee-jerk ageism, where the older we get, the less value we have and the less important our lives are to save. In fact, taking age into account when allocating scarce medical resources is anything but a knee-jerk reaction. It has been thought about and indeed implemented for a very long time perhaps as long as human societies have suffered from life-threatening scarcities and been able to discuss what to do about them. For the past 30 years, the World Health Organization, or WHO, has adjusted its healthcare priorities by measuring what it calls the global burden of disease and the contribution that various diseases make to this burden. Some diseases are more likely to kill children some, like COVID-19, pose most risk to older people, and others are equally likely to kill people at any age. The WHO uses a tool called the Disability Adjusted Life Year, or daily, to measure the years of life lost by premature death and the years of life lived in less than full health. The more dailies a disease causes to be lost, the greater its contribution to the global burden of disease. Is this ageism? Saving the life of a teenager counts for more, not because the teenager is younger, but because saving a younger person is likely to mean saving more years of life. The WHO metrics count every daily equally, whether it is a daily in the life of a healthy teenager or a daily in the life of a healthy 90-year-old. So it is not ageist in that sense. Nor should we forget that discriminating on the basis of age is very different from discriminating on the basis of, say, race. No one who is black was ever white, but everyone who is old was once young. A system of saving the lives of younger people, other things being equal, will benefit all newborn children by giving them a greater chance of surviving to old age. What about quality of life? A patient with advanced dementia may have a longer life expectancy than a patient who is still able to function normally. 
Putting aside those suffering from severe depression or in chronic pain or with other major health problems, most people want to continue to live. That is why we try to save lives. We all know, however, that we are going to die. We eat healthy food, exercise, have medical checkups, not so that we will be immortal, but to live as long as we can, compatibly with having a positive quality of life for the years that remain to us. This common sense attitude is entirely reasonable. If life is a good, then other things being equal, it is better to have more of it rather than less. Accordingly, when it comes to saving the lives of others, we should choose to save the person who is likely to have more of the good of life at a positive level of well being. Further questions then arise Should those making admission decisions look beyond medical criteria and give priority to parents with young children? over those living on their own. If doctors had ample time to become fully informed about all the relevant circumstances of those seeking admission and could be relied upon to set aside the various biases to which we're all prone, then we could ask doctors to take into account a wide range of factors. But being fully informed and unbiased is an ideal situation that can't be achieved in the real world. So the question to consider is, what rules should doctors follow, given that they can't be fully informed and, as human beings, they are likely to have their own biases? That may mean restricting the criteria for selection to factors that a doctor can rapidly and objectively assess, age and underlying medical conditions that are clearly going to have a significant impact on life expectancy. A completely objective and unbiased judgment can never be guaranteed, but it is at least more likely. Let's move to lesson two, experiments on humans. Just as the COVID-19 pandemic has led to the questioning of widely held views that have long determined who gets a bed in an ICU, so the pandemic should lead us to question moral assumptions that guide medical research with both animal and human subjects. The reason for this is that in pandemics, much more is at stake. When a new virus is killing thousands of people every day, the costs of any delay in producing either an effective treatment or a vaccine make it reasonable to defend means of conducting research that are not contemplated in more normal times. Research ethics normally prohibits exposing human research participants to significant risk. Article 8 of the Declaration of Helsinki, a declaration of the World Medical Association, reads, while the primary purpose of medical research is to generate new knowledge, this goal can never take precedence over the rights and interests of individual research subjects. I accept that this statement has played a valuable role in preventing harm to human subjects of medical research. The absoluteness of the never might be questioned, but it's not my purpose to question it here. Nor will I here discuss the fact that although the declaration absolutely forbids allowing the quest for new knowledge to take precedence over the rights and interests of human research subjects, it is standard practice, not only in medical research, but research in biology, psychology, and many other areas, to allow the goal of gaining new knowledge to take precedence over the rights and interests of non-human animals. Instead, I will defend the principle that it is permissible to expose some human members of society, for example, health workers, sorry, I should start that sentence again. I will defend the principle that if it is permissible to expose some members of society, for example, health workers, to a given level of risk because the costs of not doing so are too high for others, then it is permissible to expose fully informed volunteers to a comparable level of risk in the context of promising research into the virus. This principle has been called risk parity, for it restricts the level of risk for some to one that is on a par with that of the risks we may justifiably expect others to incur. In a pandemic, we all face heightened risks. Healthcare workers, in particular, those working with patients who have the virus face a high risk even when they take all feasible precautions to avoid being infected. 
Yet we do not tell them that they must not go to work because the cost of doing so would be too high for those, the cost of telling them that would be too high for those who have COVID and need treatment. On the contrary, we tell them that they have a professional duty to do their work. In contrast, during the pandemic, nearly 40,000 people from 166 countries have volunteered through the website of One Day Sooner to be research subjects. Those whose offer is accepted will incur some risk. The principle of risk parity suggests that this is acceptable if the risk is not higher than the risks we justifiably expect others, again, for example, the healthcare workers, to run. To defend research with volunteers, it's not necessary and it would be wrong to weaken the basic requirement that medical researchers must obtain the informed consent of their research subjects and have their proposed research approved by a research ethics committee. In assessing such proposals, however, committees should bear in mind the immense risk to innocent people of blocking promising pandemic research. In a pandemic, only the weightiest of moral reasons can justify preventing or delaying research that promises to help society to mitigate the catastrophic toll. Often such research is opposed on the grounds that it raises ethical questions. It does, of course, raise ethical questions. But the longer it takes to find an effective means of preventing the virus from killing people or making them seriously ill, the more deaths there will be, the more people there will be who are forced into dire poverty, and the more millions of others who will suffer costs to which they never consented. If these costs can be reduced substantially by allowing fully informed volunteers to take part in research that will help to speed up the discovery of a treatment or of a safe and effective vaccine, that would be the right thing to do. Fully informed volunteers might assist the search for new drugs or vaccines in various ways. But the one that has received most prominence and was, though belatedly, acted upon is human challenge trials to speed development of a vaccine. Normally, potential vaccines are tested by enrolling volunteers in a trial and randomly selecting half of them to receive the potential vaccine while the remainder receive a placebo. It's then necessary to wait until a sufficient number of the participants in the trial are exposed to infection with the virus to make it possible to tell whether those who received the vaccine have a lower rate of infection or illness than those who received the placebo. This can, and in the case of the virus that causes COVID-19 did, take months. Deliberately exposing volunteers to the virus, challenging them with it in scientific terminology, could produce results as quickly as two or three weeks. A delay of several months in obtaining a vaccine could mean hundreds of thousands of additional deaths, as well as months more of lockdowns with the resulting unemployment, school closures, and in low-income countries, millions of people not getting enough to eat. In other areas of life, we think it is praiseworthy for people to risk their lives to save others. For instance, a donor of a liver lobe has about a one in 600 chance of dying as a result of the donation, and a kidney donor, one in 3,300. Yet those risks do not persuade us to prohibit donating part of a liver or a kidney, even when the donation is going to a complete stranger. By contrast, for a young and healthy challenge trial volunteer who receives the placebo and is then exposed to the virus, the risk of death has been estimated at less than one in 20,000. Instead of prohibiting young and healthy people from volunteering for a challenge trial, we should praise them for risking their life, sorry, for risking their safety in order to save others. Regrettably, there was a lot of hesitation among researchers in taking up the offers from human volunteers. And no human challenge trials were conducted before the first vaccines against COVID-19 became available. 
Nevertheless, the development of the first generation of vaccines does not mean that there was no longer anything to be gained from such trials. And belatedly, in March of this year, a challenge trial using 90 volunteers began in the United Kingdom after approval by a special clinical, tri clinical trials ethics committee. Lesson three, making the best use of vaccines. And as effective vaccines against COVID-19 became available, governments around the world realized that never before had there been a need to vaccinate so many people in the shortest possible time. Who should get the vaccine first? That healthcare workers encountering infected patients should get vaccinated first is obvious. They face some of the highest risks of being infected. And even if because of their age, they're at relatively low risk of dying from COVID-19, they are needed in the ward to save the lives of the patients. In countries like Australia, that had very low rates of local transmission and maintained that happy situation by enforcing two weeks of quarantine in a secured facility for incoming travellers. Workers in the quarantine facilities were also a very high priority, not only for their own sake, but to reduce the risk that they would become infected and spread the virus into the community, as has in fact now happened. Who comes next? One relevant fact is that the older people are, the higher the risk. Another relevant fact for the United States, Australia, and many other societies is that members of disadvantaged racial and ethnic minorities have a lower life expectancy than others. Hence, if we give priority to older people, the proportion who are from those disadvantaged minorities offered the vaccine will be lower than their proportion in the population as a whole. In light of the many disadvantages already experienced by members of those minorities, this seems unfair. This sense of unfairness appears to have motivated a presentation by a public health official of the US Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, the CDC, suggesting that essential workers, a group numbering by their criteria approximately 87 million Americans, be vaccinated ahead of the 53 million Americans aged 65 and older. The presentation acknowledged that this would lead to more deaths than giving higher priority to older Americans. A policy of making older Americans wait longer for the vaccine on the grounds that they are disproportionately white would therefore be sacrificing lives to avoid the apparent inequity of giving priority to a group in which disadvantaged racial and ethnic minorities are underrepresented. But that's not all. The underrepresentation of those minorities among people over 65 years is slight compared to the huge overrepresentation of people over 65 among those who die from COVID-19. As a result, the policy of giving preference to essential workers would also have the consequence of causing more deaths in the minority communities that it is supposed to be treating more equitably. Fortunately, this suggestion was not accepted. Instead, the CDC's advisory committee came up with a compromise that still did not maximize the number of lives saved. A better strategy for treating disadvantaged minorities equitably while saving more lives was suggested by Dr. Ngozi Eziki, the director of the Illinois Department of Public Health, who pointed out that there are medical conditions for which the guidelines on the treatment of racial and ethnic minorities differ from those that apply to whites. The example she gave was prostate cancer screening. Because the disease is more common in black men in the United States than it is in white men, it is recommended to screen black men at an earlier age than that recommended for white men. The point is to screen everyone who is at the same level of risk for having the disease for which the screening is considered worthwhile. If we retain the current vaccination priorities, but add the principle of equal treatment for people at an equal level of risk, we will need to estimate at what age members of Black, Latinx, and Native American communities run the same risk as 75-year-old white or Asian Americans. 
and then take race and ethnicity into account in deciding at what age an individual is eligible to receive the vaccine. I don't have data indicating how much difference this would make, but it might mean that, say, a black 70-year-old is eligible for, vac for vaccination, while a white 74-year-old is not. Something like this policy was adopted by the Australian government, at the same time as anyone over 70 could be vaccinated. Indigenous Australians over 55 could be vaccinated because they were considered to be at a similar level of risk to non-Indigenous Australians over 70. Some may object that this is a kind of reverse racism, but it is not. Race is here used in the absence of more individualized evidence as an indicator of risk. The guiding principle is not to vaccinate different racial and ethnic groups in numbers proportionate to their numbers in the community as a whole. Instead, the goal, the right goal, is to save more lives. The other much larger issue relating to vaccine distribution in which racism plays a role is the global distribution of vaccines. Vaccines have been produced in rich countries. And at the time of writing, um, they were largely staying at the time right now. In fact, they are largely staying in rich countries. In January of this year, the head of the World Health Organization, Tedros Ghebreyesus, warned that the world was on the brink of a catastrophic moral failure that would lead to the loss of lives in the world's poorest countries. Although more than 180 countries had signed on to support COVAX, the global vaccine sharing scheme, the People's Vaccine Alliance, a coalition of organizations campaigning for a better deal for low income countries, said that rich countries were hoarding vaccines with more ordered than they would need, while poor countries were struggling to get enough to vaccinate 10% of their population. And that is unfortunately still the case. Buying up all the available vaccine supplies was not the only way in which rich countries were making it difficult for less developed countries to vaccinate their own citizens. Some rich countries invoked their intellectual property rights to block poor countries from manufacturing vaccines that their own citizens could use. This was a rerun of what happened in the early years of the 21st century when countries like South Africa had 4 million people with HIV AIDS, but were blocked from obtaining cheap generic versions of the drugs that could save the lives of those people. The problem is that the international patent system provides incentives for pharmaceutical com companies to create products that will be bought by rich countries because that will maximize the return on their investment. There are better systems of rewarding innovators for creating new vaccines or other products that improve health. One such promising alternative is the Health Impact Fund, a proposal that rich nations finance a fund that would reward pharmaceutical companies for the reduction in the global burden of disease brought about by their products. This would reverse the current incentives, giving the companies an incentive to see that their drugs were copied and used worldwide. Companies could still patent their products, but that would reduce their returns from the Health Impact Fund. The pandemic has shown once again that the current system of intellectual property rights works against the poor and that the world urgently needs an alternative that will provide an incentive for companies to do the research needed to develop the life-saving vaccines and drugs, but will not exclude poorer people from the benefits of their research. And just in the last few days, we have seen more talk again about opening up the uh, intellectual property to poorer countries. And we've also seen President Biden promise 500 million doses of the vaccine to low-income countries, which arguably is still not uh, a fair share for the United States to provide, but it's certainly better than what has happened previously. Let me turn now to a, a curious incident that occurred in the early stage of the distribution of vaccines in the US. It's minor, but when compared to other issues about vaccine distributions, but it does illustrate one of the, the themes that I want to talk about, and that is the problem of strict adherence to rules without consideration of their consequences. In December last year, Dr. Hassan Gokal, the medical director of the COVID-19 response team in Harris County, Texas, which includes the city of Houston, uh, 
was supervising the administration of the Moderna vaccine. At that stage, emergency workers, people over 65, and people with an underlying health condition that increased their risk of dying from COVID-19 were eligible to be vaccinated. The vaccine came in vials containing 11 doses. A vial of vaccine once opened expires in six hours and the unused vaccine must then be thrown away. On that particular day, an eligible person arrived just before closing time. So a nurse opened a new vial, leaving Gokal with 10 doses. He offered them to the healthcare workers and to the two police officers still on the site. But they either had been vaccinated or declined. He called a colleague whose parents and in-laws were eligible, but they weren't available. He started calling people from his phone's contacts to ask if they knew anybody eligible who wanted to be vaccinated and could come to his home that very evening before the vaccines expired. When he arrived home, two people were waiting and he vaccinated them. Then he drove to other homes where he knew there were eligible people and vaccinated five more. He kept calling, three more agreeing to come to his home. That would have exhausted the supply, but one of them canceled. Dr. Gokhal's wife has pulmonary sarcoidosis, a lung condition that made her eligible to be vaccinated. I didn't intend to give this to you, he later said he told her, but in half an hour, I'm going to have to dump it down the toilet. She agreed to be vaccinated. At work the, the next morning, Dr. Gokhal told his supervisors what had happened and reported the names of the 10 vaccine recipients. A few days later, he was summoned by his supervisor and told that he was being dismissed because he did not return the remaining doses, even if they had expired. Two weeks later, the Harris County District Attorney charged him with theft. A judge dismissed the charges, saying that the district attorney had failed to show that Gokhal, as the medical advisor for the county's COVID-19 response, did not have the right to decide who to vaccinate. Some moral systems treat rules as inviolable. The Roman Catholic Church, for example, holds that to take an innocent human life is always wrong. It sometimes happens that during childbirth, uh, sometimes used to happen, I should say, they, or it sometimes happens that during childbirth, the baby's skull becomes lodged in the vagina. If nothing is done, both the mother and baby will both die. Until the development of modern obstetrics, the only way to prevent that double tragedy was for the doctor to crush the baby's skull, killing the baby, but saving the mother. In Catholic countries, that procedure was prohibited because the church prohibits the direct killing of an innocent human being, no matter what the consequences. As a result, women who could have been saved died along with their babies. Utilitarianism takes the opposite view. Its founder, Jeremy Bentham, would ask of any law, custom or moral rule, what is the use of it? By that he meant, what does it do to increase happiness or reduce suffering? Bentham and his followers applied that test to a wide range of laws, institutions and practices. The privileges of the aristocracy, the slave trade, cruelty to animals, restrictions on who could vote, the criminalization of homosexuality and the disempowerment of women. Rules do have an important place, even for utilitarians. John Stuart Mill saw rules as summing up the wisdom and experience of past generations about what kind of conduct is likely to bring about a better life for all. Nevertheless, for Mill, rules are not absolute. To save a life, he wrote, it may not only be allowable, but a duty to steal. We will never know if one of Dr. Gokhal's injections saved a life, but they would surely have increased the peace of mind of those who might otherwise have had to wait days or weeks to be vaccinated. Obviously, using the doses to vaccinate people had better consequences than throwing them away. One thing we can learn from this episode is the value of sensible rules to guide those administering vaccination. In many countries, people could sign up for text messages informing them of the availability of vaccines that were available because otherwise they would expire. Especially in this age of instant messaging, it's not difficult to think of a better system than throwing away potentially life-saving vaccines. By the middle of 2021, in many affluent countries, the shortage of vaccines had been overcome. 
but a different problem had arisen. In some regions, including in the United States, Alabama, Tennessee, and other states in the predominantly conservative Southeast, many people were resistant to being vaccinated. This was making it easier for the vaccine to spread. In Australia, federal and state governments set vaccination targets to be reached before restrictions on travel would be lifted. In this, question, in this context, the question arose, would it be ethical to make vaccination compulsory? When I was writing these words a few weeks ago, I was in Melbourne, the capital of Victoria, which happens to be the Australian state that became in 1970, the first jurisdiction in the world to make it compulsory to wear a seatbelt in a car. The legislation was attacked at the time as a violation of individual freedom, but Victorians accepted it because it saved lives. Now most of the world has similar legislation. I can't recall when I last heard someone demanding the freedom to drive without wearing a seatbelt. Instead, 50 years later, we've begun hearing demands for the freedom to be unvaccinated against the virus that causes COVID-19. Brady Ellison, a member of the United States archery team for the recent Tokyo Olympics, said his decision not to get vaccinated before going to Tokyo was, quote, 100% a personal choice, insisting that anyone that says otherwise is taking away people's freedoms. The oddity here is that laws requiring us to wear seatbelts really are, quite straightforwardly, infringing on freedom. Whereas laws requiring people to be vaccinated if they are going to be in places where they could infect other people are restricting one kind of freedom in order to protect the freedom of others to go about their business safely. Please don't misunderstand me. I strongly support laws requiring drivers and passengers in cars to wear seatbelts. Here in the United States, such laws are estimated to have saved approximately 350,000 lives and to have prevented many more serious injuries. Nevertheless, these laws are paternalistic. They coerce us to do something for our own good. They violate John Stuart Mill's famous principle, the only purpose for which power can be rightfully exercised over any member of a civilized community against his own will is to prevent harm to others. The fact that the coercion is for the individual's good, Mill said, is not a sufficient warrant. There's a lot to be said for this principle, especially when it's used to oppose laws against victimless acts like homosexual relations between consenting adults, or I would argue, voluntary euthanasia. But Mill had more confidence in the ability of members of civilized communities, as he called them, to make rational choices about their own interests than we can justifiably have today. Before seatbelts were made compulsory, governments ran campaigns to educate people about the risks of not wearing them. These campaigns had some effect, but the number of people who wore seatbelts came nowhere near the 90% or more who wear them in the United States today, with similar or higher figures in many other countries where not wearing them is an offense. The reason is that we're not good at protecting ourselves against very small risks of disaster. Each time we get into a car, the chance that we will be involved in an accident serious enough to cause injury if we are not wearing a seatbelt is very small. Nevertheless, given the negligible cost of wearing a belt, a reasonable calculation of one's own interests shows that it is irrational not to wear one. Car crash survivors who were injured because they were not wearing belts recognize and regret their irrationality, but only when it's too late, as it always is, of course, for those who were killed while sitting on their belts. This year, Brittany Cobia, a doctor working in Birmingham, Alabama, posted on Facebook the following account of her experiences with COVID. I'm admitting young, healthy people to the hospital with very serious COVID infections. One of the last things they do before they're intubated is beg me for the vaccine. I hold their hand and tell them that I'm sorry, but it's too late. A few days later, when I call time of death, 
I hug their family members and I tell them the best way to honour their loved one is to go get vaccinated and encourage everyone they know to do the same. They cry and they tell me they didn't know. They thought it was a hoax. They thought it was political. They thought because they had a certain blood type or a certain skin colour, they wouldn't get a sick. They thought it was just the flu, but they were wrong and they wish they could go back, but they can't. That's a, a tragic and very moving statement from a doctor in one of the states with the highest rates of unvaccinated people and the highest rates now of people dying from COVID. I think this justifies making COVID-19 compulsory. Otherwise, too many people make decisions that they later regret. One would have to be monstrously callous to say, it's their own fault, let them die. In any case, in the COVID era, making vaccination compulsory doesn't violate Mill's harm to others principle. Unvaccinated Olympic athletes imposed risks on others, just as speeding down a busy street does. The only personal choice Brady Ellison should have had was to get vaccinated or stay at home. If the International Olympic Committee had said that only vaccinated athletes can compete, that would have freed thousands of athletes from a heightened risk of infection and would have justified overriding Ellison's desire to compete without being vaccinated. I'm not suggesting that we seize people who don't want to get vaccinated and hold them down while someone sticks a needle in their arm. I don't think that would be acceptable or politically feasible. A better way is to make access to places where people are likely to spread the virus to others conditional on being vaccinated. In 2021, France and Greece announced that they would require people going to cinemas, bars, or traveling on a train to show proof of vaccination. I don't believe that policies like that violate anyone's freedom. Let me move now to lesson four, lessons learned from lockdowns. In September last year, two groups of scientists wrote open letters to the UK government with conflicting views about lockdowns. One group pointed to the significant harms that lockdowns cause, harms that they suggest may exceed the benefits. They cited an estimate from Cancer Research UK that the lockdown has led to 2 million delayed cancer screenings, tests or treatments, which could lead to as many as 60,000 lives lost, more than the UK's 42,000 COVID deaths at that time. The other group of scientists supported the government's policy of imposing lockdowns. Cancer is only one cause of death that lockdowns are likely to increase. There are almost certainly others who will die because of lockdowns, including many in low-income countries who will have less to eat because of the global recession to which lockdowns contribute. There are also many ways in which the lockdown saves lives, other than by preventing deaths from COVID-19. In many countries, the lockdown appears to have caused a dramatic drop in deaths from seasonal flu. A group of researchers led by Olga Yakusheva, a University of Michigan economist, has sought to estimate the net number of lives saved or lost by the US shutdown. The team found that the shutdown saved between 913,000 and 2 million uh, lives, but also led indirectly to the loss of from 84,000 to 514,000 lives. That left a net saving of life somewhere in the range of 400,000 to 1.9 million. That's a wide range, but still clearly a positive saving of lives. Yakusheva and her co-authors seek to avoid the contentious ethical issues by taking into account nothing but the number of lives saved or lost. That avoids three key, key issues that a more adequate assessment of the costs and benefits of lockdowns should face. First, as I mentioned earlier, an adequate assessment would not disregard the difference between dying at 90 and at 20, 30, or 40. We should be counting years of life lost or saved, not simply lives. Second, the impact of lockdowns on quality of life matters too. 
Lockdowns cause widespread unemployment, for example, and that sharply reduces life satisfaction. According to Henrietta Four, the executive director of the United Nations Children's Fund, 192 nations closed schools, leaving 1.6 billion children without in-person learning. And for many, learning remotely would not have been a possibility. She said that at least 24 million children were projected to have left school permanently. For many girls in particular, that's likely to mean early marriage instead of the prospect of a career. A New York Times report reveals that school closures have combined with the economic hardship caused by the lockdowns to cause a big increase in child labor in low-income countries. Difficult as such impacts of the lockdowns are to quantify, a proper accounting of the costs and benefits of lockdowns can't just wave it away. Third, and most important of all, we must consider the impact of lockdowns on people who even in normal times are struggling to meet their basic needs and those of their families. Governments of countries that have many people in or on the edge of extreme poverty have particularly strong reasons to avoid lockdowns. But governments of industrialized nations also ought not to disregard the fact that a recession in the industrialized world puts at risk the very survival of people in other countries. It's been estimated that the 2020 recession pushed around 120 million more people into extreme poverty. A sharp break after two decades in which there'd been steady progress in reducing the number of extremely poor people. How much of that would have happened because of the virus, even without lockdowns, is hard to say. But the lockdowns surely contributed to the recession. Some may say that every life is of infinite value, so lockdowns are justified if, on balance, they save lives, and unjustified if they do not. I don't think we should accept the idea that every life is of infinite value. If that were the case, then we would think that our government should spend all their resources in saving lives and do nothing that is not life-saving. What about education? You could try to argue that education does save lives in the long run. But what about protecting wilderness and national parks, for example? So anybody who thinks that we should spend anything at all on those areas is denying that saving lives is infinitely valuable. Most people who go beyond the rhetoric about the infinite value of life are prepared to agree that there must be a trade-off at some point. Therefore, the ultimate question is, how can we weigh all the disparate costs and benefits of lockdowns? For to reach a decision on whether lockdowns are justified, we need to convert different outcomes into a single common unit of value, a problem that seems insuperable. One way to make progress is to consider that a lockdown, if it goes on long enough, will bring about a smaller economy that can afford fewer doctors, nurses, and medicines. In the United Kingdom, the National Health Service estimates that for about 25,000 pounds, it can pay for one more quality adjusted life year, a measure similar to the disability adjusted life year I mentioned earlier. In effect, that sum can buy a patient an extra year of healthy life. If we can then estimate how much lockdowns cost the economy, we can estimate the years of healthy life we are likely to gain now by containing the virus and compare it to how many lives we are likely to lose later from a smaller economy. Impacts that are not related to health also matter. What we really need to do is compare the impact different policies have on our overall well being. How can we do that? Ideally, we should measure well being by using individuals' reports of how happy and how satisfied they are with their lives. Doing this means we can, in a principled way, weigh up otherwise hard to compare considerations when deciding how to respond to COVID-19 or to anything else. For example, we all agree unemployment is bad, but it's not obvious how we should trade unemployment against years of healthy life. Thinking directly in terms of well-being allows us to make this comparison. Unemployment is dire for well-being, reducing individuals' life satisfaction by 20%. A broader analysis would include other impacts such as social isolation, increased anxiety, and receiving an inferior education. 
Only when empirical researchers take on the challenge of counting such impacts, not solely in terms of wealth or health, but in the ultimate currency, well-being, will we know under which circumstances lockdowns are justified. These calculations are very difficult to do, and I don't know of anyone who has succeeded in doing them in a truly rigorous manner. But that doesn't mean that we shouldn't try to obtain the data we need and develop methods of making use of that data to decide what policies will do most to improve the well-being of all affected by them. And so I come to the fifth and final lesson, reducing the risk of further pandemics. We were very lucky to have the pandemic we have had. So far, we've had a pandemic caused by a virus that is extremely contagious, but kills relatively few of those it infects. And we've also had earlier um, an epidemic caused by a virus that kills most of those it infects, but is not very contagious. I'm referring here to the H5N1 avian influenza virus, which killed 60% of those it infected. It's possible that the next pandemic will be caused by a virus that is both extremely contagious and extremely deadly. So let's make the most of our good luck and heed the warning we have received and reduce the risk of further and possibly much more catastrophic pandemics. The US CDC has said that three out of every four new or emerging infectious diseases to people come from animals. So it makes sense to reduce the risk of viruses being passed from animals to humans. With the COVID-19 pandemic, the focus has been on preventing viruses being passed from wild animals to humans. Because at least initially, many experts believed that the coronavirus pandemic can be traced to the Hunan seafood wholesale market in, uh, in, Wuna, in, sorry, in, Wuhan, in Wuhan, um, an open air wet market where animals are brought live and then slaughtered on the spot for the customers. Although there's now more doubt about whether the wet market was where the virus that causes COVID-19 first spread to humans, the idea that viruses can spread from wild animals to humans at such a location is plausible. The feces of many different species are all around the floor, and so after the animals are slaughtered is their blood. That we should do such things to animals is horrendous in itself, irrespective of its consequences for human health. A wet market is an ideal environment for the spreading of viruses that can mutate and gain the ability to bind to human cell receptors, thus adapting to the human host as the novel coronavirus does. Similar markets exist in many countries, including Japan, Vietnam, and the Philippines. In wet markets, animals of many different species may be crowded together. A permanent ban on wet markets is justified on environmental grounds, compassionate grounds, and public health grounds. For the animals, wet markets are a hell on earth. Thousands of sentient beings endure hours of suffering and anguish before being brutally butchered. As early as January 2020, Martin Williams, a Hong Kong-based writer specializing in conservation and the environment, wrote in the South China Morning Post, as long as such markets exist, the likelihood of other new diseases emerging will remain. Surely it's time for China to close down these markets. In one fell swoop, it would be making progress on animal rights and nature conservation while reducing the risk of a made in China disease harming people worldwide. The same can be said for wildlife breeding farms like those in Yunnan, which China is reported to have closed down in February 2020 after finding the novel coronavirus there. But if we are serious about minimizing the risk of future pandemics, it's necessary to go much further. Because of the risk of viruses in all wild animals, whether eaten for trade or other purposes, New York Times columnist Thomas Friedman has called for the United States to announce that it will ban all legal trade from any country that won't stop its illicit wildlife trade. I agree. But Williams, Friedman, and others who focus on wildlife also need to look closer to home. The pandemic before COVID-19 
was the swine flu pandemic, where the virus H1N1 killed hundreds of thousands of people. It originated from intensive pig farms in North America. And the very deadly H5N1 virus I already mentioned exists in chicken farms in Bangladesh, China, Egypt, Indonesia, Indonesia, and Vietnam. It's not surprising that factory farms should be the source of these viruses. As Michael Greger has written in his book, Bird Flu, a virus of our own hatching, when we overcrowd animals by the thousands in cramped football field sized sheds to lie beak to beak or snout to snout, and there's stress crippling their immune systems, and there's ammonia from the decomposing waste burning their lungs, and there's a lack of fresh air and sunlight, put all these factors together and you have a perfect storm environment for the emergence and spread of disease. Factory farms greatly elevate the risk of giving rise to a highly lethal virus, because in nature, if a virus rapidly kills those it infects, it is unlikely to spread because the infected animals will die before they can spread it to many other animals. In factory farms, with tens of thousands of animals crowded together in a single shed, a lethal virus has no difficulty in spreading. Before 2019, we had three powerful reasons for ending such methods of raising animals. Concern for animal welfare, climate change, and the health of those eating a diet too, hell, too high in animal products. Now we have a fourth reason to reduce the risk of future pandemics. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Singer, for this uh, most illuminating uh, lecture on a topic that is very timely. Um, next, um, I will invite uh, Professor Alexander Erla to give um, his comment. Um, before that, let me say a few words about Professor Erler. Professor Erler uh, was born in Switzerland. He received his BPhil and DPhil degree in philosophy at the University of Oxford. He has published in leading journals of bioethics and philosophy, including the Journal of Medical Ethics, Bioethics, American Journal of Bioethics, and Applied Philosophy. He is now completing a book on neural intervention and human identity. He is currently research assistant professor of the Steve K Center for Bioethics here at the Chinese University of Hong Kong. He is going to comment on uh, Professor Singer's lecture. And without further ado, let's welcome um, Professor Erna. Thank you, uh, Professor Li. So let me share my slides. So um, let me begin by stressing what an honor it is for me to uh, be given this opportunity to respond to a philosopher and bioethicist as uh, distinguished as Professor Singer, who, as uh, Professor Lee outlined uh, previously, can claim to have influenced, and I think we can say positively uh, influenced, so uh, the thinking and the behavior of so many people around the world, including myself, I should, I should add. Uh, so. In my commentary on Professor Singer's lecture, I would like to further explore certain issues uh, relating to the fair allocation of COVID vaccines, as well as to cosmopolitan and utilitarian approaches to public health policy. Uh, for reasons of time, I will need to set aside other important issues raised uh, in the lecture, uh, such as the issue of how to prevent uh, future pandemics, and uh, also the issue of potential alternatives to mandatory vaccination and whether they have any uh, viability. I do believe that such issues uh, too deserve to be rigorously debated, but for the sake of time, I will not address them here. So first part of my commentary. Professor Singer argues that a vaccine allocation policy aimed in his own words at saving more lives is preferable to the uh, equity-oriented approach, as we might call it, initially proposed by officials at the US Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, so the, the CDC, 
However, we have also seen that Professor Singer uh, considers it important to maximize life years as distinct from uh, life saved. And I would find it helpful to hear more about how he thinks uh, we should combine these two goals when designing policies for the allocation of medical resources. Uh, although they can often be pursued together, this is not always the case. Now, uh, while I ultimately agree with Professor Singer's assessment of the CDC's approach, I would still like to discuss what I take to be uh, an attractive ethical principle that seems to be influencing at least some of these equity-based proposals. And that's the uh, principle called prioritarianism, or as the famous uh, British philosopher Derek Parfit called it, the priority view. So broadly speaking, prioritarianism uh, tells us to give us some priority, although arguably not absolute uh, priority, uh, in our distributive decisions to those who are identified as worse off in some relevant sense. Now, what is that relevant sense? When it comes, uh, well, there are various possible metrics that can be used to make uh, these judgments and uh, they will depend on the context. So when it comes to, to tax policy, for instance, a prioritarian might equate the worst off with those who are in the lower quintiles of the income distribution and go on to defend a progressive income tax. In the specific context of allocating scarce medical resources, one example of a potentially relevant, albeit controversial dimension is age. So some bioethicists who are sympathetic to prioritarianism uh, does contend that all else being equal, younger people, or at least younger adults, should receive priority over older people in the allocation of scarce life-saving interventions like ventilators. Because, that's the reasoning, the former are in one important respect worse off than the latter, uh, namely, they have enjoyed fewer life years so far uh, with the opportunities for well-being that these life years provide. Now, to be clear, I am only using this example to illustrate what I take to be the general appeal of the idea of giving priority to the worse off, uh, but not to suggest that giving priority to younger people would be appropriate in the allocation of COVID vaccines, because for the reasons outlined by Professor Singer, in that context, it makes sense to prioritize by age exactly the other way around, prioritize older people who are more vulnerable. Of course, as Professor Singer indicated in his lecture, utilitarians can agree that it's sometimes ethically appropriate and not ageist uh, to prioritize saving younger people. Namely, when doing so means securing more years of life and thereby producing a better outcome. So this sets limits to the scope for disagreement between prioritarians and utilitarians like Professor Singer regarding the relevant distributive dilemmas. Nevertheless, disagreements will still emerge. Uh, so, so suppose, for instance, that we must choose between saving the life of patient A, who is 45 years old, or of patient B, who is 70, and that both can expect to live for another 20 years if they receive uh, the intervention. So we may assume that patient A suffers from some genetic condition that substantially shortens his life expectancy. In this hypothetical example, prioritarianism tells us to save the younger patient, whereas utilitarianism permits us to save either of these two people. Uh, and, and Professor Singer mentioned uh, in relation to the ethics of allocating as few beds that he doesn't think uh, age itself is ethically relevant. My personal intuition is that in this type of case, prioritarianism yields a more plausible conclusion than utilitarianism. Uh, and one might argue that it's more sensitive to considerations of fair distribution. And my sense is that many of those who support an equity-based approach to the allocation of COVID vaccines share uh, my prioritarian leanings, although they don't typically identify younger people as being worse off in that, that particular context. So it seems to me that at least the guiding idea behind their approach may not be unreasonable. 
Nonetheless, the difficulty, uh, as I see it, is that prioritarianism seems most persuasive when it's applied to simple comparisons of the kind that I've just described. But it proves much trickier to apply to more complicated cases like the allocation of COVID vaccines. Indeed, in such a context, unlike the two-person case I, I just outlined, uh, we will not be choosing between alternatives that involve benefits of equal size. As Professor Singer mentioned, the CDC admitted that their initial proposal to prioritize essential workers over Americans aged 65 and above in the rollout of, of vaccines, uh, this proposal would result in a larger number of deaths from COVID given the much higher risk of dying that the virus poses to the latter group. Presumably the total number of life here saved would also have been different uh, each allocation. If so, priority to the worse off, however we define that group, cannot then simply be used as a, a tiebreaker between two otherwise equally good options. Rather, prioritarians will need to decide how much more ethical weight they should give to benefits accruing to those whom they identify as worse off. Uh, furthermore, given the differences in the number of deaths expected from each prioritization, the principle in joining us to save the most lives becomes relevant to our choice in this case. And I, I do agree that this principle has appeal in its own right. So it means that to have any plausibility, uh, any application of prioritarianism to the issue of COVID vaccine allocation needs to balance the potentially competing principles of saving the most lives, maximizing the number of life years saved, and giving priority to those who are worse off, plus any other relevant principles, if, if there are any. Uh, so this is the CDC's original allocative proposal, which I've uh, borrowed from their website. It's uh, available online. The URL will be shown on the next slide. And this proposal identified US essential workers as being worse off than older uh, Americans. And the rationale being that uh, members of disadvantaged uh, ethnic minorities uh, are uh, disproportionately represented among uh, essential workers. So that's the uh, box at the, the bottom left here. And uh, the authors of this document pointed out that about 25% of essential workers lived in low income families. As Professor Singer alluded to, uh, members of such minorities also face worse, worse health outcomes and more limited access to health care on average than white Americans do, something that's at least partly explained by their overall worse socioeconomic situation, although some would also invoke uh, systemic racism as a direct causal factor. And uh, so those who, like the CDC, uh, have proposed prioritizing essential workers over older people in the allocation of vaccines seem to reason that doing so would help redress unfair inequalities in access to health benefits, and that the ethical uh, value of this goal can justify failing to save as many lives as we could. Uh, that said, in addition to uh, these considerations of equity and fairness, the CDC also mentioned the need to preserve a services essential to the COVID-19 response and the overall functioning of society. Now, uh, I do find uh, Professor, Singer's, Professor Singer's critique of the CDC's original proposal uh, persuasive. First, uh, because intuitively he, it gave too little weight to the requirement to save the most lives in the name of redressing health inequities. Uh, for another thing, as Professor Singer pointed out, uh, the proposal uh, would even seem to fail in its own terms insofar as it would have been expected to lead to more deaths among the very disadvantaged minorities that it was supposed to prioritize. And finally, it's unclear to me uh, how the CDC's invocation of the need to protect essential services fits with their acknowledgement that prioritizing older Americans uh, in the allocation of uh, the vaccines would save more lives overall. Now, Professor Singer's own alternative proposal would de facto implement some form of priority to the worst of, uh, namely disadvantaged ethnic minorities in uh, access to the vaccine, uh, 
However, it would do so, uh, as he mentioned, for the sake of saving the most lives, because uh, well, on, on the assumption that combination of age and race would be the best available indicator of risk of death from, from COVID, but, but his reasoning is not prioritarian in nature. Uh, one might still think this is a this makes the disagreement between utilitarians and prioritarians uh, not so large in magnitude, given that if, if at the practical level uh, they reach the same conclusions. I do think there is an interesting uh, conversation to be had still on this issue. And for instance, we might consider how uh, alternative proposals like the, the one by the National Academies of Science, Engineering and Medicine in the US that was put forward last year in this report, how it compares to Professor Singer's proposal. Uh, the report uh, emphasizes the need to prioritize uh, people uh, who score high on the so-called social vulnerability index, so people who are, uh, face uh, large economic disparities. For the sake of time, I will uh, press ahead and conclude this part of my uh, commentary uh, my, the, the lesson my takeaway from, from Professor Singer's critique is that prioritarian reasoning uh, is most plausible in a context la, like uh, the one we're discussing if it's used to break a tie between otherwise equally appealing alternatives. Uh, but it probably cannot play the more substantial role assigned by those who want to place priority to the worst of above the need to save the most lives. Although it might be able to play a larger role in other contexts than a vaccine allocation. Now, uh, on to my uh, second and, and the shorter part of my commentary. So, so far I have discussed the relative merits of a prioritarian and a utilitarian approach to vaccine allocation at the local level. And that's because doing so is both simpler and it's also more in line with common sense. Uh, seeking to give priority to the worst of at the global level, something you could propose, but it's arguably uh, more controversial. So for one thing, it, pre it presupposes that we adopt a fully uh, cosmopolitan ethic, one that tells us not to give special weight to people from our own country or society in our ethical deliberation. Many people do not accept such an ethic, which helps explain, uh, for instance, the prevailing disposition of most developed countries to seek to vaccinate their own citizens first. Now, of course, Professor Singer is known for arguing that we should adopt a fully cosmopolitan perspective and that our ethical obligation to help those in dire need in the developing world is much more stringent than most of us usually recognize. Adopting a global form of prioritarianism would clearly place a very heavy obligations of altruism uh, upon us, uh, requiring us to be more concerned about saving lives among the world's most disadvantaged populations than in our own country. I uh, personally do not intend to defend such an ethical approach, but I do readily agree with Professor Singer and the WHO when they tell us that more needs to be done to get poor countries the vaccines they need. Uh, whether it's via initiatives like the Health Impact Fund or the COVAX program. Uh, I do believe, however, that this also raises a question about how global exactly our thinking about these different issues should be. Uh, so when discussing the importance of saving the most lives in the context of vaccine allocation, Professor Singer and I both focus on what happens at the local country-specific level. By contrast, in his discussion of the ethics of lockdowns, Professor Singer also considered the impact of the resulting economic recession on uh, deaths and poverty rates in developing countries. And this may well be justified. Yet, uh, if so, why not apply the same criteria of global impact to the question of local vaccine allocation? Such an impact uh, might speak in favor of allocative strategies focused on uh, quickly getting a wealthy country's economy up and running again to help benefit the global poor, even at the expense of the country's older population who might receive lower priority in the resulting allocation. And this will uh, look like a perverse and unacceptable implication uh, to many. It's not clear though that moral cosmopolitans can avoid it unless they uh, do not want to think about local vaccine allocation in terms of its global impacts. If so, uh, further justification for such a stance would be needed. 
And a, a related point uh, on which I would like to conclude concerns uh, Professor Singer's argument that we would ideally want to be able to evaluate different lockdown policies in terms of their overall effects on human well-being. We might again ask whether this also extends to other policies related to pandemics, uh, for instance, about vaccine allocation. But regardless, I appreciate Professor Singer's remarks about the desirability of a single metric that would allow us to precisely compare costs and, costs and benefits of very different kinds, such as health-related versus economic ones. Uh, Yet one possible risk of a focus on overall gains and losses in well-being is that it might reintroduce the kind of objections to utilitarianism that are familiar from debates in normative ethics. Uh, Professor Singer suggested measuring well-being in terms uh, of life satisfaction. However, we know that for a variety of reasons, even fully healthy people can substantially differ in the degree to which they are satisfied with their lives. In fact, uh, racial differences under this dimension have been identified, with ethnic minorities in the US tending to be less satisfied with their lives than white Americans. Assessing policies in terms of their overall impact on life satisfaction thus raises the worry that the costs and benefits to certain people in terms of life years gained or lost might be unfairly discounted, and that this might even happen along racial lines, which would lead back to the concerns about racial justice at the center of the equity-oriented approaches to vaccine allocation discussed previously. So it seems to me that it's worth thinking carefully about whether a move towards well-being as the fundamental criterion of evaluation of public health policies would really be preferable, all things considered, uh, to the messier comparisons we use today. And if it would, whether or not it might still be desirable out of a concern for fairness to set limits on the kind of differences in well-being that we should take into account in our evaluations. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Ella. I'm now inviting Professor Singer to give response to Professor Ella's comments. Professor Singer, please. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Ella. Um, I greatly value your thoughtful response. Um, I've been asked to be quite brief in this response. Um, so just as, as you were limited in what you could say about my paper, I'm going to be um, even more limited in responding to your remarks. Um, so I'll move directly to what appear to me to be the most interesting points of contention between us. Um, and there are three of them, I believe. First, should we be prioritarians or utilitarians? Uh, Professor Erler argues that prioritarianism is more sensitive to considerations of fair distribution. But the deeper question is, what constitutes fairness in distribution? I consider it fair to treat a similar increment of anyone's well-being as equally valuable. Now, of course, uh, especially when we're talking about economic differences and economic benefits, given the law of diminishing marginal utility, that gives us a powerful reason for distributing resources in ways that favor those who are worse off. But because, uh, but, but we, we should favor them on the utilitarian view because that will maximize the increase in well being obtained from those resources. So if you give someone who is very poor, let's say $1,000, you make a much greater difference to their well being than if you give it to someone who is comparatively well off. So that's an important reason why we should favor the worse off in economic distribution, but it's not a prioritarian reason. It seems to me that the intuition that Professor Erler reports that we should save a 35 year old patient rather than a 70 year old patient where the life expectancy is equal is likely to be distorted by the fact that normally the younger patient if saved will live much longer than the older patient, or perhaps, um, that the younger patient is more likely to have dependent children um, if we take that age of 35 um, or to have parents who will grieve over the death of their child. Of course, in the example, we're told that the younger patient can't expect to live longer than the older patient. But the question is whether we can really exclude the more normal course of events from affecting our intuitions, even though we're told to exclude them. I'm not sure that we can, so I don't allow such an example to sway me from my view that uh, our aim should be to get the most well-being 
out of our resources rather than to achieve a distribution that is fair in some other sense. Secondly, Professor Erlen notes that I take a global or cosmopolitan perspective on such issues as aid and vaccine distribution, but that my discussion of whether a government should lock down their citizens to prevent the spread of a pandemic does not give proper consideration to the interests of the poor beyond the borders of the country in question. Um, or perhaps it was that my uh, views about vaccine distribution didn't actually talk about the economic benefits that uh, could be given to uh, low-income countries by restarting the economies of uh, more affluent countries. Um, so uh, yes, um, Professor Erler says that to, to do this, to justify giving more vaccines to keep the economy of a wealthy country open, to avoid harming the poor of other countries, um, could be justified, even if it cost the lives of some of the wealthy countries' older populations. Um, Professor Erler says this will look to many like a perverse and unacceptable implication. And indeed, it's, it's that appearance that is why I did not discuss it. Not because I think the appearance is correct, but because in contributing to a specific political debate going on in Australia and other countries at the time, I thought I could do more good by accepting the framework that other participants in the debate were using, namely the framework of the best interests of residents of the country. Um, as uh, was said by, uh, I think, Dr. Au and uh, Professor Chan at the beginning, um, I have had uh, a, an impact on public policy and thinking about a number of issues um, and uh, a positive impact, I hope. So um, I often in my writing, I'm, I'm trying to do that and I'm thinking of uh, how can I have an impact on this debate and sometimes to change the framework of the debate quite radically um, uh, would not actually have that impact. That is that the government would not suddenly shift to taking a more cosmopolitan perspective. Uh, governments in democratic societies, of course, are always influenced by uh, the prospects of getting re-elected at the next election. And uh, that might be affected by the fact that they take a policy which benefits poor people in other countries at the cost of increasing uh, the number of deaths in their own country or, or increasing lockdowns um, in their own country. Um, so I'm, I should add that I'm not sure and I'm still not sure if it is in fact true that avoiding a lockdown and having the virus spread really will benefit impoverished people in other countries. It's possible that because a tight lockdown will end the crisis earlier, at least in those countries where there is some possibility that the virus can be eliminated, it will lead to faster economic recovery and thus benefit people both within the borders of the country locking down and beyond them. And, and obviously such analyses are very sensitive to facts. And in, fa uh, in fact, I think the situation has changed again with the spread of the Delta virus. I'm, I'm thinking here uh, of Australia again, where it seemed just a few months ago that there was a good prospect of a lockdown eliminating the virus in Australia. And indeed that, that happened for some months in the, uh, early part of 2021. But um, with the Delta virus, the Delta variant, that no longer seems to be possible to do. So you have a different set of calculations. Finally, Professor Erler raises an objection to the development of the single metric that is, I believe, needed to enable us to compare the different kinds of costs and benefits of lockdown policies. Without such a metric, I suggest that there is no rational way of deciding whether particular policies are or are not justifiable. Professor Ayla argues that if we assess policies in terms of well-being or overall life satisfaction and racial minorities have lower well-being or are less satisfied with their lives than others, then in assessing the costs and benefits of a lockdown, the life years gained or lost by members of those minorities might be unfairly discounted. This is a very serious concern. The easy answer is to say that the problem clearly is with the underlying issues that cause racial minorities to have less satisfaction in their lives. And we need to give higher priority to dealing with that problem. If we succeed, as we hope we will, the issues Professor Erler has raised will disappear and race will become irrelevant to well-being. 
That's true, but perhaps it's too easy an answer. What, what if we fail and members of racial minorities remain on average at a lower level of well-being than the majority? Strictly speaking, taking this unfortunate fact into account in adding up the costs and benefits of a lockdown would not be discounting life years along racial lines. Instead, we would be counting well-being in a racially blind way. But if nevertheless, the outcome of this policy is that on average, the life years of members of a racial minority count for less, that's bad enough. Given our present deficiencies in accurately assessing well-being, it would be better if in calculating the costs of benefits of policies with widespread effects like lockdowns, we adopt the dictum that Mill attributed to Bentham. Everybody to count for one, nobody for more than one. That may not be the most theoretically precise form of utilitarianism, but perhaps in our present racially divided societies, it is a heuristic that leads to outcomes that have better consequences than any feasible alternative. Thank you. Um, thank you, uh, Professor Singer. Uh, the time is now uh, open uh, to, uh, for Q&A. Uh, some audience have already typed in questions in the Q&A space and Professor Andy and I will take turns to refer to uh, the question to Professor Singer and Professor Ella. Uh, so if other audience uh, also have questions, you may also type in the questions. Uh, it, because uh, of the limited time, we may not be able to uh, answer all the questions and uh, nor will we necessarily have to uh, go sequentially because some of the questions are raised by more than one audience. So uh, for maximizing the utility, we may uh, actually uh, allow those questions to jump queue. Okay, so um, may I first to uh, uh, first open the uh, first question. The first question uh, raised uh, was, uh, what if a 36-year-old patient, uh, a parent and an eight-year-old child suddenly have brought to the hospital uh, with conditions requiring immediate surgery, but only with one doctor available? So whose life would be safe, would be safe and why? As opposed to this question is following the uh, line of thinking on years, uh, on the uh, number of life years saved uh, rather than individual uh, cases can have one life. So Professor Singh, would you uh, comment? Thank you, that, uh, that, that is a, a very tragic situation, of course, and a very difficult situation. Um, I, I, I would say that if, if everything else is equal, if uh, there's no reason to think that the surgery will not restore them to a normal life expectancy for someone of their age, um, we should save the eight-year-old child because that child will have a longer life expectancy. Um, it's it's a, actually an interesting question if you push it right back and you say, well, suppose that you're talking about a, a newborn baby. Um, perhaps, you know, I have argued previously that that does make a difference because uh, not because of the, obviously the life expectancy of the baby is, is still going to be longer, but um, because of the effect on others because of the effect on um, the, 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 the newborn baby is not really part of the social networks and the close family ties to the same extent that uh, perhaps an eight-year-old child certainly is um, by that stage. So I'm, I'm not committing myself to always just go with more life years and therefore with the younger patient, everything else being equal. But um, I do think with an eight-year-old child, I would still give preference to the child. Thank you. I'll close the question and let uh, Professor Lee introduce the next one. Okay. Um, there's a question from someone called uh, Yeon Poon, and he or she said, thank you, Professor Singer. Do you think it is acceptable to do animal experimentation for developing vaccines for humans? Well, um, although I am opposed to a great uh, proportion of the experiments that are done on animals, because I don't think that they are absolutely essential or, or life-saving. Um, there are some limited circumstances in which I'm prepared to accept experiments on animals. Um, I'm not sufficiently familiar with 
uh, the possibilities of testing vaccines on humans rather than on animals. Um, if that's possible, I th and, and if it can be done uh, with healthy human volunteers, uh, as I mentioned, who are at very low risk of uh, getting the the uh, the virus or very low risk of dying from the virus, then I would think that would be the better outcome. But of course, it might be said that uh, the safety of the vaccine itself has to be established in some way. And whether you're young or old or healthy or not so healthy, um, it's possible that the vaccine itself is dangerous. And um, if we can reduce the risk to, to humans at that stage, by using animals, but using animals in a way that is as humane as possible. That is, for example, uh, if they start to show symptoms of illness, not allowing them to continue to suffer, but performing euthanasia. Um, I could imagine that that might be justified. Uh, as I say, I would need to be convinced that there was no other way of establishing this um, uh, without a, a really high risk to, to humans. Uh, fortunately, we're starting to develop more alternatives using things like cell cultures that um, can screen many dangerous ingredients, and I welcome those developments. But um, I have always in my uh, writings uh, argued that when it comes to, to causing death, that uh, normal humans have more at stake. Um, because of their awareness of their existence over time, the extent to which they plan for the future and know about the future and have hopes for the future, um, that death is a greater loss to a normal human than it is to a, a non-human animal. Um, so uh, I, I would not, let, let me just say, I would not absolutely rule out the use of animals if uh, it was considered that at least in the initial stages of testing the safety of a vaccine rather than its efficacy against the virus, um, the risk to humans was unacceptable. Thank you, uh, Professor Singer. Uh, we'll take the uh, next two questions together, Professor Singer, uh, both on uh, your view on mandatory, making vaccination mandatory, the argument for that. Uh, there's a question by, I'll, I'll show the questions in turn. Uh, there's a question by Professor Roger Jung of CHK uh, that perhaps the analogy between seat belt and vaccine are not exact because seat belts does not pose much risk, whereas the vaccine, particularly being a new vaccine, uh, does put, uh, have some uh, risk to the person taking the vaccine. So that's one comment. Um, I'll show the, also the other uh, question um, the, um, the other question, it has a similar line of uh, uh, thinking whether the two are really comparable. Uh, besides the uh, safety issues, uh, there's a question, uh, a point that perhaps there are alternatives to vaccination, at least in low prevalence uh, countries and places, for instance, like Hong Kong, we are controlling quite well by other means and measures. Uh, would it still be fair to be requiring mandatory vaccination. So uh, can we take two, these two questions together? Uh, yes, certainly. Um, with regard to the comparison with, with seatbelts, um, in fact, when seatbelts were first made compulsory, uh, there were people who thought that there was a risk uh, in wearing a seatbelt. Um, they talked about instances in which in, a, in an accident, a car might catch fire and the seatbelt release might not work so that uh, the person wearing the seatbelt would be burned to death in the accident rather than be able to escape. Now, um, that can happen. I wouldn't say it has never happened, but it's an extremely low risk. Um, but it did figure in the discussions about whether to make seatbelts compulsory. Um, in the case of the, the vaccine, um, well, arguably, when the vaccine was first starting to be introduced, um, there was not sufficient evidence of the low risk of the vaccine. But now that um, it has been administered to uh, some billions of people, I think the latest figures are, um, uh, and we have a very good sense of the number of adverse reactions, seriously adverse reactions that we get. 
I think we we do know that the risk is also extremely low. So I don't think the analogy is all that different. It may be different uh, to some extent, um, but not so different. Um, Sorry, I've now just remind me what the second question was. It was also about um, oh, yeah, so it was about country, countries where there is a very yeah, low rate yeah, of oh, yeah. the virus. Uh, right? What what if they are actually uh, considering that there are actually alternatives to yeah uh, vaccines yes, right. protecting the population, wearing masks, uh, some degree of social distancing. Yeah. Uh, so um, yes, the, the problem is that if a country does not vaccinate. Um, then they are going to have to maintain their uh, restrictions on uh, incoming on, on people coming into the country, um, and uh, you know this was the situation in Australia uh, some months ago before the current outbreak of the Delta variant, uh, and there was tremendous pressure on the government because it was preventing uh, Australian citizens from returning to Australia when they wanted to do so. Um, the justification being that there were limited quarantine facilities and uh, the government could not admit more than a certain number of people each week because it was requiring them to spend two weeks in quarantine. And it was doing that because there was a low rate of vaccination in Australia at that time. Uh, and that was because we hadn't, well, it was a complicated story, but we, we didn't have enough supplies of uh, the vaccines that we were prepared to administer to younger people. Um, so uh, there is a significant cost for the country in that, and certainly the government was under a lot of political pressure. Um, people were saying, you know, how can you keep Australian citizens from returning to Australia? Now, what they could have done, of course, was build a lot more quarantine facilities quite rapidly, and I think that is probably what they should have done. Um, and you know, maybe there are other countries where that's uh, they've provided uh, sufficient quarantine facilities. Um, so in that, that situation, then yes, I think you could say uh, we should not take surplus doses of, of vaccines. We should pass them on to countries that have uh, higher rates of the virus and low rates of vaccination. I think that would be a more ethical response. But at the same time, you know, again, for the reasons I, I mentioned earlier, in, in democratic countries, it's hard to expect governments to do things that are against the interests of those who they're hoping will re-elect them. So I'm not really surprised that um, the Australian government did not actually take that course and, and say, no, you know, we, we won't try and get vaccines now, uh, pass them to countries that need the most, we'll wait. Uh, that would certainly not have been popular with the majority of Australians. Thank you. Uh, over to you, Hans. That's a question, uh, and I'm going to modify the question a little bit because uh, I'm also interested in it. Um, and that is the question about uh, the booster. I mean, in the UK and the, and the US, where you know, where the situation is getting close um, to to where that uh, those who want to be vaccinated have mostly mostly been vaccinated, and people are talking about booster now. Um, but there also concern that uh, moral concern and maybe even prudential concern that perhaps instead of people taking a booster um, the vaccine should be donated to African countries uh, where the vaccination rate is very low like two or three percent and and um, I'm just wondering you know given your perspective uh, stated in your famous uh, famine paper uh, what's your view on this? I mean, would you say that, uh, um, you know, I mean, apart from uh, practical, you know, concern, uh, practical uh, concern about democracy or local government getting elected, would you have a philosophical objection to, you know, to the booster uh, line of thinking? Uh, no, I would not have had a philosophical objection to countries saying, um, before we give boosters to our citizens, we will uh, wait until low-income countries have adequate supplies of, of the vaccine to, um, to give to their own citizens to protect them against the virus, assuming that they have the virus there, as of course, uh, generally they do. Um, 
Uh, I think that's especially true as as the evidence for the benefits of the booster shots is is not even all that clear. It's just been debated in the last uh, few days in the United States, and uh, the FDA has, I think, only uh, yesterday approved boosters for certain categories of people for 65 plus um, and others with underlying health conditions. But um, but there was a debate about you know how necessary this is, depending what vaccines you've got, how long should you um, allow but before you get a booster. So given that, and given that there are countries where, as you correctly point out, um, very, very few people have been able to receive any vaccine at all, um, I think philosophically uh, it's not justified to provide boosters for citizens in affluent countries. Thank you. Thank you. Um, there's a, a question which is from, uh, along a, a different topic. Uh, this question uh, by Owen Sh uh, Shaver uh, asks, what do you think of countries prioritizing politicians for vaccination because their ill health will impair ability to lead the country? And the example may inspire hesitant constituents to be vaccinated. So is that carry weight? Uh, yes, I think particularly the second of those reasons carries quite a lot of weight. Um, where there are a significant number of people who are hesitant to get vaccinated, I think uh, po political leaders should get vaccinated and they should get vaccinated on TV um, so that uh, everybody can see that they're getting vaccinated. Uh, I think that's a very useful example. Um, in terms of uh, the first reason that uh, they uh, need to stay healthy to lead the country, well, I suppose some people would debate about how, how well are they leading the country in some of these circumstances. And for those who are leading well, um, this is a good reason. Uh, and for those who are not leading so well, it's not a good reason. But the politicians are not going to be the best people to judge themselves as to how well they're doing or whether uh, if they did become ill, a replacement would actually do better. So um, in, in theory, yes, for good leaders, you do want to keep them healthy and working, um, but who's going to decide who are the good leaders? Thank you. Hi. Okay, um, there's a question, um, and it says, uh, you gave a very nice example of an ethical lesson to the family of the person who died because of uh, he or she was not vaccinated. Uh, would you support mandatory vaccination enforced by any means, police incarceration, and and and, and you know and and what else? Okay, so so we, we so the question is uh, what what means of enforcement would you recommend? Um, yes, that's that's a very good question. I, I mean, I do as I indicated support um, everybody being vaccinated, but. But there are real questions about um, what means of enforcement are reasonable to employ. Uh, you don't want to create a state where the police are seizing people and uh, jabbing needles or getting a doctor to jab needles into their arms. Um, and I would also argue that if people really um, are prepared to avoid mixing with anyone else, then um, perhaps they can be allowed not to be vaccinated. Um, you know, this is the issue about paternalism, where, where they don't pose a risk to anyone else. You're vaccinating them for their own benefit. Um, if they are really strongly resistant to that, um, let's say you supply them with information, they resist that, and they're prepared to go and, and not mix with other people. Now, how exactly they might do that will depend on their situation. Um, I, you know, we can imagine that they live in the country on a large area of land and they are able to provide for all of their nutritional needs. They grow vegetables. Or, um, so uh, if they say, look, I'm going to stay here until this pandemic is over and I don't want to be vaccinated, okay, I, I would let them do that. But um, what I would say is uh, I, I would make it mandatory to be vaccinated if you're going to mix with other people. So I think it would be reasonable to require people who are going shopping, going to cinemas, going to restaurants, using public transport um, to, to be vaccinated. And uh, the method of compulsion there 
would simply be to refuse them admission to those facilities if they're not vaccinated. Uh, and I think that would, uh, and, and also for employment, of course, which is a, a major factor. Uh, so um, I think that would lead to a sufficiently high rate of vaccination to um, prevent the pandemic spreading further. Thank you. I think we probably have just time for maybe at most two more questions. So I'll do one and Han will take the last one. Um, this question is from probably from a frontline clinician, perhaps working in public hospital and settings in Hong Kong, I guess. Uh, the question uh, is an ICU question in rationing. If we take seriously uh, maximizing so the utility of the ICU care, will you consider uh, the ICU's ability to reduce pain to be one consideration? Specifically, for instance, admitting a burn patient uh, to an ICU, uh, besides saving life, it will also be very significantly reducing the suffering from the burn, whereas COVID, uh, though stressful, is not similarly painful. Uh, so I guess underneath that, there's a question of comparing mm. COVID and non-COVID patients in ICU allocation as well. Uh, yes, thank you. That's a very interesting question. Um, and of course, in what I said, I was just talking about maximizing life years saved because I was thinking of comparing COVID patients and, and COVID, though distressing, is not an extremely painful condition, um, I think. So, um, yes, if, if you, I would certainly take the severity of pain in account if we were, say, admitting a Burns patient. Um, uh, and if, if uh, the only way to reduce the patient's pain is to admit the patient to the ICU, then I would do that. Um, hope to get the pain under control fairly rapidly. Of course, we can do that with drugs too, um, even if necessary to render the patient unconscious for a period. Um, and perhaps we wouldn't need the ICU bed for very long. But um, I certainly think that extreme pain, extreme suffering is something that gets a lot of weight um, and that's, in a sense, talking about the quality adjusted life years rather than simply life years, which I think is um, a better measure uh, of overall well-being, where, where we can take that into account, where we can get a sense of how good or bad the quality of life might be. Thank you, Han. Uh, you. Okay. Great. Thanks. Uh, that's a very good question from uh, Patrick Chan. And he asks, which of the two is a, is a better ethical strategy? Strict lockdown to try to eliminate the virus or coexistence with the virus? Well, um, you know, that was a very real question in, in Australia at a time when it seemed that we had eliminated the virus. Indeed, I think actually we, we had eliminated the virus for a time in Australia uh, before it was reintroduced mm -hmm. um, through a leakage from the quarantine facilities some time later. So um, the strategy of strict lockdown to eliminate the virus seemed to be the right strategy. Um, and if we had had better quarantine facilities, then Australia uh, would not be locked down now. And in fact, it's not all lockdown. The, the state of Western Australia, for example, um, still does not have the virus. And it's now pursuing a strict lockdown as well as a strict uh, state border closure. Um, so I think that's reasonable for uh, that situation. But once the Delta virus got into Sydney and Melbourne um, and was not uh, really con con seemed not to be controllable, Sydney's lockdown I think was too loose at first. Um, and that, but then the Melbourne lockdown was quite strict, but seems not to have uh, made progress towards eliminating the virus, although it has reduced the number of cases and perhaps it saved lives by preventing. Uh, ICUs being um, uh, unable to deal with all the patients who need ICU beds. So, um, um, you know, if you can eliminate it, essentially my answer is it's justifiable to have very strict lockdowns, um, but then you have to have very good quarantine. Um, where you can't eliminate it, which is the situation clearly in many other countries here in the United States where I am, um, also in the United Kingdom, um, then I think it's reasonable to say, we should ease up the lockdown to give people a bit more of a normal life. 
to avoid the many harms that come from the lockdown to many people um, and try to be reasonably safe through uh, using masks and uh, again, encouraging vaccination. Um, I think there are various policies that you can use to do that um, and, and try to have a more normal life. Uh, thank you very much. Um, we, I think we have taken uh, a total of maybe 12 questions or 13, uh, but there are now another 20 questions in line and many of them are really good questions. So my apology for that. Uh, so now by way of closing, may I on behalf of CHK and the benefactor of this event uh, to thank Professor Singer for this, this most inspiring lecture, uh, Professor Ella for the comment and for all the audience for joining this event. So good evening, good morning in East, in East Coast and goodbye. Thank you very much. Goodbye. Bye bye. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Peter. Thanks a lot. Thanks to all who helped thanks, to make this thanks possible. Thanks so much. Thanks so much, Peter. Thank you.